Thank you very much. Let me also say uh, I am both a Swedish and British citizen. I've also uh, been a member of the Austrian President's Delegation of State for Trade and Industry for, for a period of 10 years. And I was chairman of the Young Conservatives Party in the only conservative constituency in Sweden. In those days, there was only one. Um, and I have also fought a long-standing uh, case against the EU in Brussels. So why do I say all this? I say that because I have uh, seen the European Commissions from many different angles. As a Swede, as somebody who has been involved with the Austrian government, and of course as a British citizen. And I should also say that at the same time uh, as I was uh, deputy treasurer, I was very much involved in European affairs as an advisor to uh, the leaders of the opposition and the shadow foreign secretaries. Now, what's just happened is that uh, the country has spoken. And that means Brexit. We are where we are, and regardless of conviction, it is something that we have to get on with and deal with. And the longer we wait, the worse it is for the country. Why is that? Because of the uncertainty. Uncertainty that makes people having to take decisions in the wrong direction for Britain making investments outside Britain instead of in our country. Uh, people, leaving the, people leaving the country instead of staying here. People going to different places. And that is why it's so important that we find a way forward where we can present transparency and show everybody that uh, this uh, uh, Brexit negotiation is something that can hopefully be achieved very quickly and to everybody's advantage. Not only Britain's advantage, but also Europe's advantage. There is a lot of fear in Brussels and also out in Europe that this is a watershed moment for Europe and that other countries will follow suit. I think that's quite unlikely because with the exception of France and Germany, there is no other country with the same stature as Britain. And the kind of Brexit that uh, is most likely to come is not something that can be replicated really by any other country. And that is why those fears hopefully will subside. I think Europe and particularly the, the two big countries, France and Germany. Not only are they our real negotiation partners, but I think they have come to realize that, uh, uh, as Mrs. Merkel said last week, actually to me, if we're all sensible, we'll find a sensible solution. Now, much has been said and much has been written in the papers about different scenarios. Um, and I have to say, this is a complicated subject. And that's something that worries me because I am not sure that our civil servants and also our politicians are far enough up the learning curve to take fo this forward in the time frame that is uh, necessary. And I think here, government needs help from uh, the business community and also the legal profession, because a lot of this is about business common sense and also legalistic issues. So that's a point that I would like to make very strongly, uh, uh, that, that that is something that is uh, very important to achieve a good outcome. Now, 
If we look here at uh, a possible deal, what could that look like? I think there are only three areas which are key, and that is uh, what we do in immigration, uh, financial services, and trade. So we start with uh, immigration, and that's really what uh, for many the vote was all about. Uh, how we control immigration, not how we close our borders, which is uh, how, how uh, it has been perceived, particularly outside the UK, that this what the vote was about. But it's all about how do we control our borders. Here, I think it's fair to assume that we will get from the EU exactly what we put in on a reciprocal basis. So whatever we are prepared to offer is something that we can expect to get in return. Now, here I believe we need talented and highly skilled people in Britain. Uh, and personally, I think it's good, the more the merrier. Um, and in certain areas, I don't think they need to have work permits if they're EU nationals to come and work here. But there are other areas where we have to be concerned and where we have to have work permits, uh, particularly for people that come here, uh, not in bad faith, but they take jobs away from our people and in particular on the lower end of the wage scale. So what's happening right now, if you go to, and I say this just by way of example, but if you go to Poland, it's quite difficult to find workers in Poland. Most of, a lot of workers there are actually coming from U the Ukraine. Because most of the Polish workers, in some skills, they have gone to other countries within the EU because they get better paid outside Poland. And that can't be right. It's not right for Britain. I think it's also something that uh, uh, the EU within itself needs to find a way to better regulate. How I lead to that. So on immigration, we need uh, a good balance of uh, work permits and uh, also uh, uh, to make sure that we get skilled and talented people. The next area is uh, financial services. And London is really the financial services centre of uh, Europe. And that is because of our language, our legal system, and our long tradition of, uh, of uh, excelling in this area. Uh, most of the talent, most of the competence is in this country. Now, <clears throat> it's not going to be convenient for either the EU or for us to continue with financial passporting if we're outside the EU. But there is another way of dealing with uh, uh, financial services, and that is regulatory equivalence. What that means is if we have the same regulations as, uh, as uh, the EU has, then we can operate on the same basis. And this system encompasses about, let's say, 90% of all the different financial services. And many of those who are not included actually don't make that much uh, business sense or are very almost uh, uh, peripheral. So that would be a way forward for financial services. The third big area is uh, uh, trade on goods. And here the fallback position is always going to be WTO uh, standards. And what that means is uh, trade with tariffs. Now, if that were to happen, let's look at the, uh, the picture of that. And that is that 
we have a trade deficit with Europe, which is quite significant, somewhere around 60 to 80 billion, depending on when you measure it. And if we look at uh, the, comp the mix within the EU, uh, we only have trade surpluses with very few countries. They are Estonia, Croatia, Greece, Malta, Cyprus, and Ireland. That is six countries out of 27. Now, if we exclude Ireland, who represent, uh, I guess, about, uh, well, in terms of the deficit, 5%. The others represent less than half percent of our trade. So it's uh, almost a rounding error in this. So the paradox here is that if we go back on tariffs, uh, we stand to earn as a country about 12 billion pounds a year in import tariffs. What you have to balance against that is the tariffs that our exporters would have to pay, which uh, would amount to 6 billion. But still, we have a, we have a surplus, a net of 6 billion, which is not insignificant. And if you add that to what we save in EU budget uh, uh, contributions of about uh, 9 to 10 billion, we get to a number of 15, 16 billion, which is about 1% of our GDP that we are better off, assuming that our trade, of course, will continue as, uh, as normal. So, given that immigration is quite clear, and given that uh, there is really only one way of uh, dealing with financial services in a negotiated deal, what we're looking at is whether we will have tariffs on trade or not. Now, if you're a German car exporter, and the German car exporters to the UK, they actually, they would end up paying three billion of tariffs to the UK. And that's not a nice scenario for them. Or take the French wine producers from Bordeaux uh, and Bourgogne. Uh, tariffs on wines and spirits are about 45%. And that's uh, about one and a half billion for them that they would end up uh, having to pay over in tariffs to our government. And add to that to that, that uh, the most likely uh, president of France, if you look at opinion polls, is somebody who comes from there, Alain Choupé. Uh, I see common sense, I hope common sense will prevail, um, that uh, Europe will come to the conclusion that uh, tariffs is not a good thing and that we will have tariff-free trade. Uh, if not, the worst case scenario, or however you look at it, is that we actually gain a net of six billion in tariffs, looking at 2014 numbers. So that's not such a bad scenario. So when we then look at uh, hard Brexit, soft Brexit, I think that is almost a misused term because uh, the outcomes, if you analyze this, uh, there is not that much room for maneuver. Europe has made it very clear how they interpret how this could go uh, with respect to the four freedoms. Uh, we uh, have our options, and uh, uh, yeah, in the end, we're, they, they are actually very good. Uh, so, I think, and that's the, the last point I want to make today, is that uh, hopefully we shall look back on this <laughs> in a few years and think of it a little bit like 
with a bit of exaggeration, a storm in a teacup. Um, and that it all ended well for, for Europe and, of course, for Britain. Thank you.